Yo, hey, I'm Vivek Mahobani. This is Kinetic Outcome. So uh, Hector's not here. So come on in, come on in, come on in. Uh, welcome to my crib, guys. This is where I like to exist on a daily basis. As you can see, very polite little guy over here because you will see two glasses. Mine, Hector's. Me on time, Hector not here anywhere. Now you will see I have my little kitchen, trying to keep it as clean as possible. And then, as you keep approaching into my little mini house, you will see we're already 70% of the tour done. Bathroom, nothing to film there. And of course, my room where I work most of the time. The space that I like to be in, I spend a lot of my hours over here. And because of that, I have to stay young, which is why I have my toys. Ladies and gentlemen, and as Vivek introduced it earlier, we are with Kinetic Outcome. So Vivek, a uh, little bit of introduction of yourself, um, let's just say where you were born, how you started, how you got to where you are. So first of all, this year I'm 36. Mm -hmm. I've been in Hong Kong, born and raised for 36 years. Uh, grew up in a in full Indian household, however my parents did not speak Cantonese, so they decided, wait, you live in Hong Kong, you must speak the local language, and they decided Cantonese is too difficult to learn, so they would decide, son, you go learn it instead. So they sent me to a Chinese school to learn Cantonese, I grew up in a Chinese school in primary school, secondary school, stayed in Hong Kong for university, graduated, I was actually a web designer. Uh, I love websites and everything, however I also love stand-up comedy, and so in 2007, I tried a stand-up comedy competition. I loved the idea of being on stage, just talking and making people laugh. And ever since then, I've been doing it and doing it. And it's transitioned into my full-time career. So today, my job is to tell jokes and tell people pay for them. That's what I do. Okay. <laughs> well, that's still pretty cool. I thought you were younger. Oh, really? No, man. I'm an old man. Be respectful. 36. Yeah. When I cross the road, hold my hand. Okay. Yeah. Well, next question is... Yeah. Uh, you spoke about it earlier, being part of uh, web design and uh, comedy. So how did you slowly transition from web design to fully being in the business? Okay, so web design started when I was in university. So what happened was, I loved websites and I was like programming and everything like that. And one of my teachers noticed and said, hey Viv, you want to do a freelance job? And I was like, is there money? He's like, yeah. I was like, duh, 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 of course. So it was a $500 job, no big deal. He told me, it's like do a photo gallery for this graduation ceremony. And he said, okay, just make sure it's ready by this, this, this date, okay? So I was like, okay, fine. I started working on it. And the whole idea of a freelance thing where I'm like, so I don't have to go to your office. I just get it done before the deadline. That's it. That's all I have to worry about. And I love the idea. I gave it to him. He gave me the money. I'm like, this is great. This is what I want. So after I graduated, I started my own kind of web design company, my one man company. And I started from there. At the same time in 2007, I saw a comedy competition ad and I joined it. So in the beginning, comedy was like a hobby. IT web design was like the job. Okay. So over the years, I loved comedy, I kept doing it as a, as a side project, a side passion and everything. And every now and then you might get someone, hey, uh, you're pretty funny, why don't you come perform in our event? Hey, you're pretty funny, you want to come to our company and do, the, do a gig, you know, that kind of deal? You might get a gig here, get a gig there. You slowly build your brand. And over the years, my web design, because I've been busy with comedy, I get fewer web design jobs or I can't take on so many jobs and it's kind of transitioned. To the point now, I've, my website company's kind of stopped. I only have a few old clients that I help out every now and then, but other than that, I, it's only comedy or comedy related. Like I'm a web, I'm a, sorry, I'm a MC, I'm a comedian, I'm a ring announcer. So yeah, just basically give me a mic, let me talk into it, and that's how I live. That's cool. <laughs> it's all with the voice. Yeah. Just the voice. Exactly. Sit in my throat and I'm un unemployed. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, next question is um, the challenging parts of the process and of course the rewards as well 
but what was really <clears throat> rewarding. Just those moments that you can't forget, that's like, you can envision it every time. Honestly, like with comedy, the most challenging part is like, will these people laugh? Can I make them laugh? And the most rewarding is, oh my God, they're actually laughing, right? So you do a gig where you might have people who are like, you know, oh, so, 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 posh, posh, like, mm, who is this boy? You know, who is this, you know? And those people, they're, they're used to like sitting back and appreciating stuff. You know, you perform and they, they clap and stuff like that. But with comedy, it's such a live thing where like when I tell you a joke, you gotta laugh now. It's not like, oh, please let him continue, you know? So when you have a crowd like that, you gotta adjust yourself and you can, if you can make them go from, oh, oh, oh very funny to, oh, this guy's good, I like him, you know? I love that transition and that feeling is really rewarding. At the same time, my comedy, I get to do it in schools. I get to perform at private events. I've gone to hospitals to perform and just the joy of seeing families with, let's say, their sick relative, having a good laugh together. You know, that in itself to me is like, wow, turns out a joke is so much more powerful than just like, ha ha ha, bye. And it's like, wow, everyone wants to have a good laugh. And those are the things that are most rewarding to me. The, honestly, the biggest challenge really is finding your own style of comedy. Like, why would people come watch you? I can watch a bunch of comedy online. But what, what's different about you? What can you do that I want to watch you live? You know, why watch you know, instead of the next guy? That's the biggest challenge, the branding aspect of it. Okay. And then the life side of it. Yeah like trying to make both sides work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So this is the thing, right? We live in Hong Kong, it's very practical, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you may have a job, but if it can't pay the bills, it can't pay the bills. You can't lie about that. Now, comedy is very interesting because it's also a creative art. So I don't just do comedy gigs. I actually do a lot of things related to comedy. For example, I've worked uh, with the Jockey Club for their Happy Wednesdays, and I had a booth call, you know, be a rapper. And I made a rap that was like in English and Cantonese about horse racing, but it was a tongue twister. So I made that whole thing up, we made the booth, and then eventually I was there as the host of the booth every day and playing with people there between races. So it's not really stand-up comedy, but it had an aspect of making people laugh. So my whole goal is that I do things that make people laugh in general. So whether it's an MC or a comedian or a host or, or, or at a booth or whatever, it's irrelevant. It's just basically making me laugh. At the same time, uh, I also do other things, like I go to schools, give talks, I give workshops, I also do ring announcement work, so like it's a whole different game. Like so comedy, ha ha ha, ring announcer, oh my god, you know, that kind of a deal. So all that stuff adds together. So this is how I make my living, through a lot of different sources of different types of work, but all related to one thing where I'm the performer, I'm in control, and I basically give you an experience. With, either by learning a new skill, or laughing together, or going, yeah, kick him, kill him, whatever it is, you know, that's how I do it. So, Honestly, it, you can make it work if you find your niche in the market and also you have to find what you really enjoy. I really enjoy the fact that I'm, in, I'm on the stage and I got a bunch of people who I'm like basically kind of controlling and leading into a certain experience. So it's just like ring announcers, you're on the stage getting everyone hyped up. I love that feeling of like, all right guys, make some noise. You're like, yeah, the power. So that kind of a deal. So I would say, yeah, it, I, I made it work. This is my full-time job. I'm living very comfortably in the sense that I can, uh, if I feel like I need a coffee, I'm not going to think like, oh my God, I can't afford it. I'm like, okay, I can afford it. Not every day, but I can afford it. That kind of life. So it's good. All right. Sounds great. Do you do uh, comedy lessons as well? Yes, I do do comedy workshops in the sense that, uh, depending on who's asking, for example, a lot of schools, they have extracurricular activities. So I teach in primary schools as well, teaching kids not like how to write a joke, but how to see the world from different angles. So comedy is just seeing the world from a different angle and finding the funnier angle of it. So I encourage kids to think like that. Instead of just saying, oh, this is wrong, this is right. It's like, hey, this is interesting. Oh, why, why did you do that? And be curious, you know. If I go to, let's say, university, they're thinking more practical skills. So I, I've done like a lot of pitching classes where I say, as a comedian, we're doing the same thing as anyone with a great idea. When you go to a pitching event, you have this idea in your head and you're pitching it out, hoping that whoever's listening likes it and they give you money, right? Same with comedy. I had this great joke in my head. I go to pitch it out and if you like it, you give me laughter. It's the same concept. So I talk about how I use my, my methods and processes to put it all together and how do I deliver it and how, how do I manage to get someone to respond with laughter without me saying, hey, laugh now. They would just know when to do it. So a lot of those workshops, companies, they want like new skills, for example, their salespeople to be a little bit more humorous and more outgoing with their clients as well. So I talk about all that where, because my job requires me to connect with people. So being able to connect with someone is an aspect you cannot avoid in life in general. So I'm able to translate that depending on who the audience is. Okay. And uh, next question is, what do you think of Hong Kong's approach to the industry that you're in? 
So Hong Kong's approach to the entertainment industry, I'll go with the general broader aspect of it, is that it's very closed circuit. So many, many years ago, if you see a celebrity, they're on TV, that's it. There's no other pathway. You have to be on a certain TV channel. However, in today's world, it's changed. We got the internet. So more and more people are getting famous through, let's say, YouTube and the internet. And all of a sudden now, the power is not within the so-called entertainment circle. The mass population still is there. For example, pop music is still the most powerful thing. You know, Canto pop music sells much more than any other music in Hong Kong. But it does not mean that everyone only listens to Canto pop now. They're open to other ideas as well because they've got exposure to it. Same with comedy. Before you would think, oh, who are you to tell me jokes? You know, you're not a celebrity. But now people realize, wait a second, you don't have to be famous. You just have to be funny. Oh, you're funny. You have a YouTube video? That's pretty funny. I'll, go, I'll come watch your show. So it's opened up as well. The challenge though is that the history of comedy in Hong Kong is still much, uh, much younger than the overseas areas like Western Hemisphere of the world. Because like in Hong Kong, if you talk about maybe comedy, maybe 20, 20 something years old. But whereas uh, overseas, it's 60, 70 years old. So people know, like for example, people come to a show in Hong Kong and they'll sit in the front row without realizing they might get picked on. But if you go watch an English show, people are like, yeah, front row, comedian's gonna pick on me, I get it, you know, that's how the game is. Mm. So that culture is still there. So if anything, it's not the industry, it's more like the people, the education of the public, the consumer, who is, is growing and getting there. So over the years, people now know comedy as an aspect of general life. Uh, companies no longer thinking magician and dancer, hey, let's get a comedian, this will be fun, right? People's parties are like, hey, you know what, let's get a comedian, let, let him make fun of us, you know, that kind of a deal. So it's changing in that aspect. So it's more about the audience, the consumer learning about this culture, rather than saying the industry. The industry won't, won't do anything except for money, right? So, but people have, a, they, they have an appetite for something more than just, oh, look, a, a pretty face. That's how it's changed a lot now. Cool, and you're part of that ripple effect. Well, the, I like I said, it's not just a pretty face because you have to have a pretty face for people to say that. So I'm using the, I'm banking on the aspect that they focus on my comedy, not here, the comedy, the comedy, you know, that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm in that circle right now, yeah. Okay. Well, what would you suggest to people who aspire to become like you? I would say the first thing is be very honest with yourself that know what you want. The challenge of what I'm doing is for the first few years, there was like no income. There was no real reason to do it other than I enjoy it. So if I ne didn't enjoy it, I'm sure by the second year, I'd be like, ah, I'm wasting my time. I'd rather go home. But because I enjoyed it, I'm like, hey, I'm tired, but you know what, I'm gonna do it. It's, it's fun, let me do it, let me do it. It's like going to the gym, you know? If you go to the gym just because someone tells you you have to do it, after a while, if you don't see the results you want, you're like, ah, forget it, I'm gonna go home. But when you have the motivation and the interest in yourself, it's not about like having a six pack anymore. It's about feeling that like, good, you know, going to the gym, like, hey, I went to work out. I feel better. I'm sleeping better. You get it? So it's different. So I would say step number one, really be honest about it and ask yourself, what is it that you like? Uh, I always say, don't limit yourself to what the world has today. Limit yourself to what you want to do. So for example, Einstein said, you know, imagination is more important than knowledge because knowledge is just the world we know, but imagination is unlimited, right? So if you just imagine what would I want to do? Then think of that and imagine you do it for like eight hours every day, six days a week. Can you picture yourself doing that? If you can, you're in the right direction. That's number one. Number two, think about what you like doing and just do something similar to it, even as a hobby. For example, you may say, I, I love singing. All right, that's cool. You know what, what else other than singing can you do? Can you like basically go busking? Can you go on the streets? Can you go to church? All this kind of stuff. Where can you use opportunities that allows you to do like singing? with that as well. And then over time, people will notice you, hey, it's you again. Oh yeah, I saw you over there. Oh, I remember that. It's like a branding aspect. When they keep seeing your face, people are gonna be like, who is this guy? Why do I see him everywhere? He must be somebody. Let me check him out. That kind of aspect. So it always builds from basically exposure, experience, and basically just finding what you really love doing. And you won't want to stop. You would just keep doing it. No matter how tired you are, you, you, would, be, you would go to sleep, wake up like, you know what? I'm ready, let's do this. And you have the motivation again. So those are the two things I always say. Then after that, it starts getting autopilot. Things just start flowing once you really, really have the motivation to go for it. Okay. Well, what makes you, you like, let's just say in the word unique? Okay, so I guess unique for me, I mean, as an Indian guy who grew up in Hong Kong, I speak English and Cantonese, that in itself kind of stands out, you know. At the same time, I'm also not worried about is this really possible? Is this practical? I'm thinking more like, is this what I want to be doing? And I will make a way, I will find a way to make it work. So I think the thing unique about myself is that in my whole life, I never really fit in. 
So because I never really fit in, automatically ne not fitting in is my norm normality. So when I was young, I used to listen to heavy, heavy metal music. My friends are like, what's this? This is crazy, right? Uh, my friends would wear certain clothes. I'd wear, oh, you look weird with this stuff, right? Uh, the way they look, the way I look, you know, I got shaved, they don't have shaved, that kind of stuff. So it was just different. So it became to a point that in my life, I no longer was like, hey, what are you guys doing? Let me follow. I was more like, if you're doing this, probably is not right for me anymore anyway, because I could never fit in. So that in itself made me very unique in the sense that I no longer wanted the traditional way. I wanted something just completely absurdly different. And that is what I do with my comedy as well. I don't want to just tell you jokes. I want to tell you about the absurdities of my life, about your life, about life in general. Have a good laugh and you know, let's just go, who cares? Let's have a good time. Which is why you'll see, I'll do stand-up comedy and then I'm a ring announcer. And it's just like so, how did this all come together? It was just the aspect of like, how absurd can I make my life? How crazy, how outside the box can I be? So why not do all these things that are completely not your traditional mindset? So that's what makes me unique. Like I love the, the challenge of can I do something so weird? And I love, I love the fact that I can't fit in. So I, I, without trying, I stand out. Okay. Who do you look, who do you look up to most? Um, if you say comedy wise, yeah. I mean, I grew up watching Jerry Seinfeld and Chris Rock and the classics. Nowadays, I love Bill Burr. He's my idol. I love his style and the, the, the raw edginess of his stuff. Uh, but I, I look up to honestly just people with their own style. So people I admire is like let's say Brucey, like you know, like B Water, my friend, the sign right here. That's one of his quotes. And mm -hmm. I admire him not for the fighting. I admire him for the fact that he was like, I don't care what you think. I'm doing what I want. Oh, you don't agree with me? That's fine. I don't care. Oh, you tell me I'm wrong. I don't. I don't need your your approval. You know. And I love that idea where it's like he's not harming you. He's just saying, I'm doing my thing, what's it to you? So I love people who are like that and they found their own style through that method. And yeah, anybody who does that, I admire in general. So a lot of guys uh, who are basically not really pioneers, not really spearheaders, but basically guys who are like, it's irrelevant about what the world around me thinks. This is what I'm doing. If you wanna come with me, come with me. If you don't, it's your choice. I'm walking. So you can follow or not, it's up to you. Those are the people I admire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And uh, next question is, um emotional barriers maybe along yeah. the way or just yeah. people that didn't support you like what you said earlier i'm yeah, gonna yeah. walk this walk either you're here or not yeah yeah, yeah. i mean with anything in life you can't avoid emotions you know like there are days when you're like oh i don't want to do this oh right so i i spent a lot of time self-reflecting in the sense that i still do i write a journal every day and what i do is i don't just write a journal i actually read what i wrote one year ago to see where i was and compare it, how's my life now? How do I think of the thing that happened to me a year ago? It's very likely whatever bad day I was having a year ago, not only have I forgotten about that, but even if I do remember it, I'm like, oh yeah, well it's gone, you know, it's, I'm over it. So it's a constant reminder that no matter how bad my day is today, within one year's time, I not only will be over it, I'll, I'll probably have completely forgot how I felt. So it doesn't matter how bad my day was today. So if someone tells me something that really upsets me, it will bother me, but I'll know the longest time it will take is one year. And in a year's time, I'll be just fine. So if I can wait it out, I guarantee I'll be okay a year later. So these are small, small things I do. Like every morning I tell myself, you know, be grateful for what two things that happened yesterday. It's just a reminder that no matter how bad my day today is, by tomorrow I'll have two things that I'm grateful that happened today, you know? But at the same time, you still meet people that you know, will say stuff to you and you, you think that they know what they're talking about. But over the years, the more I do stuff, the more I realize nobody knows what they're talking about. Right? Everyone's kind of just guessing their way. It's just that someone feels more confident in their decision making or their ideas. So it's like saying, when I was young, let's say 10, 12 years ago, when I first started my business, I was like, oh, I'm learning about investing and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, let me talk to my uncles. You know, they, they've been investing for like 20, 30 years. They must know. And they're like, oh yeah, you know what? When it goes down, you buy. When it goes up, you sell. I'm like, oh, okay, I, okay. I guess that's how it is. And then they were like talking about short-term investing and everything. But over the years, I kept like, why am I losing money? This doesn't make sense. But they told me like, how can they be doing the same thing? Turns out it didn't make a difference. They were just guessing as much as I was, even after 30 years. So what I learned was people may be doing the same thing over and over again, but does not mean just because they've been doing it for 30 years, they're better than you. Just like saying, uh, if you cook for 30 years, but you cook badly, you're still a bad cook. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. You know? So in the same way, like anyone who's doing their own business, if they hate their job, it doesn't matter how much money they make. It doesn't matter how high the position is. You could be the CEO of a company, but every day you hate your life, then no, you don't, you don't tell me how to live my life. You know? So that kind of a deal. So a lot of people will always tell you things that make you doubt yourself, 
but it's normal because you're doing something so absurd that even they be like, I, I cannot see how this will work. This, this scares me. So I cannot accept this. So that's actually in its own way a good sign. When, to, when everyone's saying like, this is not right, this is not right, then then you self-reflect and be like, is this right? And if you can be very honest and look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is right, this is what I want to do, then there's, there's no worrying about what people say. So the challenge really is like controlling your own emo emotions and being honest about how you feel without worrying of approval. Everything you do, no matter how good it is, someone's going to not like it. I've had jokes that I've told a thousand times, but there are still people who've come up to me and say, hey, you shouldn't say that joke. That's, I don't like that joke. That's an offensive joke. I'm like, how did that offend you? This is crazy, you know? Like, I can make a joke about being Indian. They're like, oh, come on, don't, don't joke about Indian people, you know? People make fun of us already. Why are you making fun of us again? You know? I'm like, what? It's just a joke. Relax, you know? If anything, I'm making fun of myself. You happen to be Indian. I'm not talking about you. So these kinds of things, you know? Over time, you just kind of look past it and say, look, man, life is life. So it's more about being honest about how you feel. That's what I always say, without worrying too much about what people want you to feel. Yeah, that helps a lot. Okay, that was a solid basis of many points. So, good to take in. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I just added another extra question before the last one. Sure. Um, going back to what you do, your experience in performing yeah. in different areas outside of Hong Kong as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like which countries have you touched already? Just because of passion. So, Honestly, you know? comedy itself has taken me around the world to the point it's, it's really bizarre. For example, my first ever cruise ship I've been on was because of comedy. And I was like, I've never been on a cruise ship. This, I, I don't know what it's like. And I was like, I can't believe I'm here. This is crazy. Uh, I got to travel to a lot of Asia Pacific. I, my first time in Australia was because of comedy. My first time in Japan was because of comedy. Uh, my first time in Kuala Lumpur was because of comedy. First time in Singapore was because of comedy. Uh, a lot of these places. So I've been mostly in Asia Pacific. You know, uh, the funny thing is that comedy is taking me to these places, but it's also opened up the door to like fight events. I've traveled to different places to do fight events. I'm like, well, I can't believe I'm over here. You know, this is crazy. MC though. MC, yeah, yeah. I'm not fighting. Thinking, like, this, keep fun of the fighters. This, yeah, I would, be the, I would be like the one to one million bet guy. Like if this guy wins, you deserve a house, man. Yeah, so no. Uh, but yeah, just these kind of things take me around the world. And I, and I really appreciate it because every time I go there, I'm like, wow, I can't believe I'm over here. This is crazy. This is my job. It's not a vacation now, you know. Of course, there's two sides to it. I always say, I travel the world. It's great. But it becomes a business. It becomes a job, you know. You find yourself on a plane going like, how many more hours? Ten? Oh, God. You know, you do that. And I was just in Vancouver this year, my first time ever in Vancouver as well because of comedy. And I remember I'm on the plane for like 12, 13 hours sitting going like, this is a part of comedy people don't tell you about. The terrible sitting on a plane, go like, oh my god, I'm so tired, but I can't sleep, you know, that kind of a deal. So there's a lot of that. I would say I've traveled around Asia Pacific, I've been to Canada, I've been to the US because of comedy. And, and it's, it's great, I love it. And the problem now is for a vacation, if you tell me, hey, where do you want to go for vacation? I'm like, I don't want to go anywhere. Don't you dare take me to an airport, I will kill you right now. <laughs> I'm going to sit at home, don't move, no luggage, no packing, nothing. Yeah, it's a reverse for me. All right. Well, last question is uh, anything to expect this year or the coming year? Plans or so comedy shows online? One, one, of, one of my crazy ideas I've always had is like, you know the Hong Kong, they have the speech festival. Basically, it's like they have poetry and all this kind of stuff. And I've always had this idea. I'm like, what, wouldn't it be so cool if there was like a stand-up comedy category in the speech festival where it's mandatory that every school send representatives to join the speech festival and one category is stand-up comedy. And I was like, I, I'm going to make that happen, man, one day. One day it's going to happen. I want to go to schools and see kids telling comedy jokes. I'm like, yes, this is it, you know, because one of my beliefs in, Hong, in life, and especially Hong Kong, is that we're so effective, we're so productive, but we forgot what we're doing it for. So when was the last time you sat down and told someone a story? Very rare. You tell a kid maybe, but not your friends, you know. And we forget the joy we have of telling each other stories. When you have a reunion with your friends and you talk about the good old days, you have a certain fun feeling of that, you know, because it's a story. At the same time, my like, comedy is about telling stories. And we're all just laughing about the stories of life, but we forget to tell our stories. So one thing I always say is like a really good example, that like, you know the, the, the uh, phrase, stop and smell the roses? Like in Hong Kong, we're really good at planting roses. In the beginning, one rose, two roses. I want to make a garden, a beautiful garden. Okay, great vision, right? Plant, 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 plant. 10 roses. Okay, you know what? I want 20 roses. 20. Oh, you know what? I want 30 roses. We're so busy planting the 50th or the 60th rose that the first rose you planted, not only did you forget to smell it, it's now dying. 
you know so then you kind of forget what you're doing the whole thing for so for myself i always say one of my goals is i want to build a culture of comedy in hong kong and asia and also to, to show the world that we're all funny we, we can all be funny so i have this thing called a laugh festival that we do every year in like september where we bring together comedians from around hong kong just let's do shows after show one night after night last year we did like 40 shows over a month it was crazy and uh, yeah, so this year we're talking to comedians, trying to put it all together now. And I'm talking to schools, trying to say, hey, can we do a comedy club? You have a debate club, a basketball club. Let's do a comedy club, you know, so kids can kind of tell funny stories. So that's one of the goals I have. Hopefully this year, next year, and maybe in five years time, you people with kids will one day have to be like, okay, son, the punchline, remember the punchline. That'll be a, hopefully a dream come true for me as well. That'd be cool. Yeah. Make sure you contact me. I will. <laughs> yeah. Well. I guess that's about it. Ladies and gentlemen, kinetic outcome. Thank you very much, man. Good. <laughs>